We're going to talk um, this afternoon about uh, zeal and the story of Phineas and the story of the altar of Ed. Uh, I was asked about a reading for this, and I thought, why would we need a reading? I know you are all very good Bible students, and if I bring nothing uh, new to the table for you, then you can call this a review. Um, the first question I want to ask is, what exactly is zeal? Because zeal is a word that is synonymous to the story of Phineas. Phineas was a man uh, zealous for the Lord, but he was also a man. You know, we talked about uh, self-deception this morning, and in this story we'll see a little self, self-deception again with the story of Phineas. And did I spell it right? I'm going to have to check, because I, I spelled it wrong in my notes. So what is zeal? So what I did is I went to a dictionary, and I looked up the word zeal in a dictionary just to see what they would call zeal, and they call it eagerness and ardent interest in pursuit of something. So like a passion or a zeal uh, for something, an ardent interest uh, in something. Uh, what's that? Enthusiasm, yeah. Uh, fire in the belly, if, if you will. That's really what zeal is all about, right? Uh, I looked it up in, in a uh, Bible dictionary as well, and they called it an earnest temper. I think that's a nice word to use for zeal. But they say maybe enlightened or ignorant. So zeal isn't uh, exclusive to knowledge necessarily. Sometimes zeal is just a passion for something, whether it should be a passion for something or not. Uh, the question we want to consider uh, today is where should it come from? Again, I'll start off by telling you a quick story. Uh, Sister Cindy used to work years ago for a company called American Flexible Conduit, AFC. And she had a, a boss who was uh, director of sales and marketing, I think Jim Dollins was his name. And you never met a more zealous guy uh, than Jim. Jim was a true salesman. And what he was selling is was flexible conduit. Does anybody have any idea what flexible conduit is? What is it, Roger? Right. It's it's it's. Thank you. That's that's deep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You run wires through it and you run it in the ground, right? So it is probably one of the most exciting projects ever made uh, to sell is flexible conduit. It's just the the stories on flexible conduit can never end. As far as Jim was concerned, Jim was, he loved it. He liked to talk about it. He liked to show it to you. He was a flexible conduit fanatic. But he was a flexible conduit fanatic because he was selling it. And he was a good salesman. I guarantee you, I don't know if Jim ever left uh, American Flexible Conduit and went to flexible something else. I don't know. But if he did, I can assure you, whatever it was, was the greatest product uh, since the dawn of time because that's the way... Jim was. He was a zealous guy for what he did uh, for a living. Um, in, the, in the 60s, uh, zeal was a big deal. Uh, you had the war in uh, Vietnam, and you had many people who were zealous for it, and many people who were zealous against it. And so you would see a lot about zeal uh, in the 60s, but of course, whether or not the zeal for it was correct, or whether or not the zeal against it was correct really has to do with your perspective uh, on the 60s and certainly doesn't have to do with the zeal of the Lord. And so what are we as Christadelphians passionate or zealous about? Well, first and foremost, I think more than anything, the contribution that we have is our zeal for the Word of God. We have a very unique and special perspective on the Word of God. We're going to talk more about it later on, so I don't want to go diving too much into it. But that's really what our zeal is and should be. You know, we're not a, a benevolent society. Our zeal is not necessarily, although certainly we try to do what we can, but you know, there are other organizations that are charitable organizations. There are other organizations that are bigger, that have tremendous, you know, choirs, and they have, they're zealous for song and that kind of stuff. For us, our zeal lies in this word. 
and the truth that we find in it, and the honesty that this word, this word provides for us, for those who are exercised thereby, if you will. So that is what our zeal should be about. And as we pointed out this morning, um, it should transform our character. Our brother mentioned, uh, our, in his, brother Bob mentioned in his prayer this morning, uh, the signs of the times. And we should be zealous for those as well, shouldn't we? The, the, I said to somebody recently, I said, we're going to have to stop calling it um, latter-day prophecy. We might have to start calling it present-day prophecy because it's so coming so powerfully true uh, before us every single day. And so we're zealous to follow these things and, and, and to see and hope for the return of Jesus Christ. We're not, we're not zealous for the, for the difficulty that it's going to create, though we recognize that that's the reality of the situation. But we're certainly zealous for Christ's return. And well, we should be. And so we have this, this question about where zeal should come from. Well, first of all, let's consider the Lord's zeal. It says in Isaiah 9, verse 7, and this is obviously a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it says, Of his increase and of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. And again, it's a, it's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what it says. It says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Well, Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts, is a title for God. And it is God's zeal that is going to perform an establishment with justice, with judgment, and with justice. And you see in those two words, two aspects of the Lord's zeal. One is of his wrath, and the other is of his peace. But it is the Lord's zeal that can be both a zeal of judgment, and at the same time, a zeal of justice. And we, of course, want to be on the side of peace for ourselves so that we don't feel the wrath of God. Now, when we consider Phineas, we're going to see an act of tremendous zeal of judgment, as, as I know you know. But it's going to seal, interestingly enough, a covenant of peace. Now, what about our zeal? So our zeal, as it points out in our little previous thing about the Bible, it can be uh, good or ignorant. It says in uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul is writing to them about the Judaizers. It says, those people are zealous to win you over, but, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that, they might, so that you might be zealous for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. So he's talking about the Judaizers, and he's saying they were zealous. They were zealous to possess you. And we know that they were zealous to bring back the law. They weren't, they weren't saying, don't believe in Jesus Christ. They were saying, you should believe in Jesus Christ, and you should keep the law. And Paul says, that's not, that's not good, right? Because Christ nailed the law to the cross. We understand that. And he's saying, they want you to be zealous for them. So they want you to be zealous. But you need to be zealous for the right reason, right? And if you're zealous for the right reason, then you are, you are a part of the family of God. Those that went to the Judaizers lost their path to Christ. They were zealous, but they lost their path to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can be zealous for all kinds of things. Jim Dalton was zealous for flexible conduit. Clearly, we can be zealous for anything. But the Judaizers were zealous for the law. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 1, let's take a look there for a second. What did you say, 45 minutes? <laughs> It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you in such fornication as it is not so much as the Gentiles that one should have his father to wife. And ye are puffed up 
and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So we know this story. We know that in the Corinthian Ecclesia, there was a man who was, if I've got it right, who was sleeping with his father's wife. I think I have that correct, right? And he's saying, so, so, and you think that's a good thing. Well, it wasn't that they thought the man sleeping with his father's wife was a good thing. What they thought was, we have such wonderful liberty that we can allow this person to be a part of our ecclesia. And Paul says, that's, that's the wrong perspective. Your perspective is wrong. You don't, your liberty is not a liberty to sin. And it's not a liberty to allow whatever goes on around you to be okay in your ecclesia. This man has a problem. He has a clear and obvious problem. And you're not dealing with that problem and you're using your liberty and you're using your, your zeal for that liberty to say, oh, we can, we can deal with anything. We can accept anything because we're made free in Christ. And Paul says that's not right. And so we know, he says, you've got to get him out. Why? Why do you have to get him out? Be, be, because that man has something to learn, right? He, you've got to pass him over to Satan so he can learn his lesson. And we know the results that happen, right? They, he does learn his lesson. He does break up that relationship. And then they won't bring him back in. Then they're zealous, right, to keep him out. If I remember correctly, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, I think I got it right here, do I? Oh, that's the one person. Yeah, they were puffed up about it. For behold, this self-same thing, going back to the same story, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. So when Paul pointed out to them that they were doing the wrong thing, they acted. Remember we talked this morning about, about perspective and saying you look at yourself in the mirror and you need to act. And so they did. And Paul calls it zeal, what they did. But of course, then we know, then they wouldn't bring it back in. Then they told him he had to stay out. Well, that's not zeal at all. Well, it's zeal, but it's self-zeal. For our God is a God of mercy and a God of peace. That's the Father that we're looking for. In... Titus, chapter 2, verse 14, it talks again about these things. Let me punch up Titus, chapter 2, verse 14. And he's talking about what sort of zeal we, have, we should have. And it says, He who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And that's the zeal that we should be seeking to perform, the zeal that is zealous of good work. So let's consider this story of Phineas and the lessons we can learn about zeal from it. And the first of the two events takes place in Numbers chapter 25. So turn over to Numbers chapter 25. And we're in, the, we're in the wilderness, and we know that a terrible thing happens. And it says, Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Well, what had happened was, remember, uh, Barak, Barak tried to get Balaam to curse Israel, right? And Balaam couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He says, I can't do it. I, I, I'm trying, because Barak was going to pay him. He said, I can't do it. But then you know what Balaam did? Then said, listen, I can't curse him, but you can corrupt him. Send your women in to the men and tell them, you, you worship and make sacrifices, so do we. So let's get together and have a sacrifice. A nice little ecumenicalism, if you will, right? Let's, all, let's get together. You worship this way, we worship that way too. And they did. They said, well, what's wrong with this? They worship the Lord as well. The problem was the worship, the Lord that they worshiped was not the God of Israel. But it's a sacrifice, right? So it's a sacrifice. You can say it's to yours. We'll say it's to ours. Verse 2, And they called the people onto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto 
Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So then the Lord speaks to Moses, right? He says, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord might be turned away from Israel. Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord. Well, that's a really harsh judgment. And Moses doesn't do it. Right, because the next verse says, And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. So why doesn't Moses do something? Well, Moses' integrity is compromised. Right, because notice it says, They committed whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Well, here's the problem with Moses. Moses was married to a Moabite woman. So, is he not committing whoredom with the daughters of Moab? Well, he wasn't. But it could be seen that he was. And so Moses, rather than acting, said, well, I can't be the guy to act because I have a Moabite wife. And who's going to say, well, who are you to do this? So instead, he turns to the judges of Israel and says, slay everyone his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And what did they do? They didn't do anything. Why? Because we're talking about their brothers and their sons, and maybe even some places themselves. So they didn't act either. And verse 6 says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianish, a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moab, Moses. I'm sorry, it was a Midianite. In the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So he brings his wife right smack in the middle of that tabernacle, right before Moses. And in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, this is all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Why were they weeping? Why were they doing that? Well, there's a plague, right? So we know they're weeping because of the plague, but they're also weeping because nothing is getting done, and no one has the power or the strength or the courage to do anything. They are at an impasse, and the Lord is punishing them, and nobody's doing anything. And then it says in verse 7, And when Phinehas, or Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from amongst the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and went in after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. And Phineas the son of, and, and the Lord said unto Moses, saying, Phineas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel. Behold, say, uh, therefore say, behold, I give unto him a covenant of peace. So Phineas was this super brave guy who stood above everybody else in righteousness and said, if somebody needs to do something, I'm that guy. No. That's not it at all. Because look what it says. In verse 4, it says, All the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and then it says, And Phineas, he rose up from amongst the congregation. So Phineas was there, weeping with all the rest of the congregation because nobody had the strength to do anything. When you see Phineas, do you think of this brave man, and it's reasonable to think so, who stood up stern and grabbed his spear and marched into that room, and we know what was going on in that tent, and drove that spear through and came out and said, There, done. Brothers and sisters, that's not it at all. 
Phineas was weeping in that congregation. And when he grabbed that spear, he was weeping just like them. And he walked into that tent in pain. And he drove that spear through in pain. Because he had no right more than anyone else to do it. But he didn't do it for him. That's what zeal is. That's what zeal for the Lord is. And how do we know that? Because it's called a covenant of peace. Phineas was the son of Aaron. He was a Levitical priest. Notice what it says. See if I can find it. I don't remember exactly where it is. There it is, verse 13. And he shall have it in his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. An everlasting covenant, an everlasting priesthood. What is that? That's not a Levitical priesthood. A priesthood of peace. What is it? It's a Melchizedek priesthood. He was given an everlasting priesthood. He's no longer a Levitical priest. He's now a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest in Christ's kingdom. Why? Because he was zealous for his God. And he made atonement for the children of Israel. In weeping, in weakness, as Christ bore our sins in his body on that tree and made atonement for us. That's why Phineas went in there. Because somebody had to do something. And he put aside his own failures, his own self-deceptions about himself, and said, somebody's got to do something. It's not about me. It's about God. And that's what the everlasting covenant of peace is all about. Putting aside that self and being zealous for God. And that's what Phineas did. And it's a powerful lesson. And it's the greatest of all priesthoods. It's the one we seek to have ourselves. But if we stand on our own self-righteousness and walk in with that spear and drive it through, we're no better than anybody else. But God has a way of things, and he has called us to his purpose. And for Phineas, that meant doing a very painful and difficult thing, but it had to be done, and so he did it. I mean, it's a marvelous story. But it's also a sobering story when we look at the next story about Phineas, and that's in Joshua. And that's the story of the altar of Ed which is a name, I just love the way it's put. You guys know about the altar of Ed, but a lot of people don't know about the altar of Ed. And they say, do you know about Ed in the Bible? Ed, there's no Ed in the Bible. No, there's an Ed in the Bible. Absolutely, there's an Ed in the Bible. Here, I'll show them to you. So after what happened was Joshua took the tribes into the land. And remember, there was the, one, the two and a half tribes that wanted to stay on the east side of Jordan. And Joshua said, you can stay on the east side of Jordan as long as you come over to the west side and you help us fight to establish the land, right? And so Reuben and Manasseh, Reuben and Manasseh are the half tribe, Reuben and Ephraim and the half tribe of Manasseh, I can remember how that exactly goes. They go with them for seven years, right? They leave their, their wife and kids on the east side and they travel over to the west side and they fight alongside their brothers to establish the land in the land of promise and the land of Canaan. For seven years there, they are fighting side by side with their brother. And at the end of seven years, Joshua calls him aside and he says, You know what? You've done your duty. You've done what you said you would do, and you did it, and now you can go home. Right? And that's what takes place in Joshua chapter 22. We're going to pick it up in verse 10. And when they came onto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the, and the children of Gad, there they are, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see. So what, what was this altar? So And where was it? So where it was, interestingly enough, so they were on the west side, and they were traveling back to the east side. 
And before they crossed over the Jordan River, they built a giant altar. And they called it an altar to see, or an altar of witness. And it says in verse 11, And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Massa have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shittim to go up to war against them. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gab, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead, Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest. So who better to go there and pass righteous judgment upon these, these rogue brethren than Phinehas? And do you see the parallel to Numbers chapter 25, where it says, The whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shittim to go up to war against them. That's the same congregation that stood there weeping outside the tabernacle saying we're not strong enough to do anything. And now they were. These guys, these brethren had fought side by side with them for seven years for the needs of those brethren on the West. And when the people of those brethren heard about it, that they were building an altar, they said, this is all wrong. And they built and put an army together and they put good old Phineas right at the front of the line to go back there and hold these people responsible for what they had done. And off they marched over. And Phineas comes before him and the battle is about to be in array, but first Phineas is going to give him a little piece of his mind. And he tells him, why have you done this? What were you thinking? Didn't we already suffer enough? Notice what it says in verse 17 of uh, Joshua 22. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us from which we are not cleansed unto this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? Ring a bell? Phineas goes right back to it. But that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be seeing ye rebel today against the Lord that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Phineas says, don't you remember what I did? And it was Phineas that forgot what he did, or at least why he did it. Right? Because that's what the flesh does. And so before the battle starts, they explain, you, you, you don't get it. You don't understand why we did this. Notice, it, we'll pick it up in verse 23, that we have built us an altar. This is the Reuben Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh explaining to Phidias and the army come to fight him. That we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offerings, or if to offer peace offerings therein, let the Lord himself require it. They said if we built this offer, altar to create a different altar than the one that's in Shittim, then we deserve to be punished. But think about it. It's a huge altar. How are they going to sacrifice animals on this huge altar? And they built it on the wrong side of the river. They're going over to live on the west side of the Jordan, and they built this altar on the east side, this giant altar. So every time they had to sacrifice, this, the argument is, well, they didn't want to go there, so they built an altar for themselves. Well, we built it over here. Why would we build it over here if we're building an altar for sacrifices? Now we've got to march, march back over the Jordan again. So that's not, that's not why we did it. It's not about that at all. If, if you stopped for two minutes and thought about it, you would realize that's not what it's about. Verse 24, And if we have not rather done it for fear for this thing, saying, In time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. So they said, you know why we built this altar? Because we're going to go over there, and you're going to be over here. 
And you're going to say, you don't have anything to do with us. You're not in the land of promise. And you know what? We're going to listen. We're going to say, you're right. We don't have any part of you. And our children will stop fearing the Lord. And we don't want that to happen. So we built an altar that we can see from over there and you can see from over here. And it's going to be a witness to both of us, that altar, that we're brethren, just like we were for seven years, just like you've already forgotten. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generation after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that our children might not say to you, that your children might not say to our children in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. And then down in verse 30, when Phineas the priest and the princes of the congregation and heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words of the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh speak, it pleased them. And Phineas the son of Eleazar said unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us because we have not committed trespass committed this trespass against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. Remember, just a few moments before, Phineas is saying, you're delivering us into the vengeful hand of the Lord. That's what you're doing by building this altar. And then it's Phineas that says, you know what? You have kept us from sin. Your zeal for the Lord your recognition of your own weakness and our weakness is why you built that altar. It was your zeal for the Lord and your recognition of your own weakness that built that altar, and we didn't see it. Why? Because we've just spent the last seven years clearing out all these terrible nations and all their evil sins, and you know what? We started to feel pretty darn good about ourselves. And we forgot about our own brother. Our own brothers and sisters, we forgot about them. They walked away and we forgot about them right away. We thanked them for their service and away they went and we forgot what they had done. We never really considered that they just spent seven years sacrificing themselves for us. We lost our perspective. And that's how easy it is to lose your perspective. And that's why the Lord sends these wonderful examples to make us stop and take, take, take a look, honest look at ourselves. We want to be zealous for God. We should be zealous for God. In the ecclesia, we should be zealous for God. In our communities, we should be zealous for God. But it has to be about Him. If you've had a situation in the ecclesia where somebody has a cause, they say, we need to do this. This is what we have to do right here. We're not doing it. It has to happen. And you, you look at the brother and you think, well, you've got a dog in the show. You want that to happen because... It helps you. We can't have a dog in the show. We have to be zealous for God's things. And we can say this has to happen because it needs to happen for our ecclesia, for our families, for our community. But it can't happen because it makes us better off by doing it. And we can't be the leaders if, if that's what's leading us in our charge. Well, we should be signing this or we should be doing that. Well, yeah, because it serves you. Your integrity is gone. But if you do it as a sacrifice for somebody else, like Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, then your integrity should never be gone. We had a brother one time. We were having an issue in the ecclesia. Uh, somebody wanted to join the ecclesia, and it was, a, it was a game somebody else was playing to get into the ecclesia and get into Central Fellowship. And we knew that that's what this one person was doing, and so we just we just didn't want to talk about it. And he was using a member of his family to, to, to make this maneuver. And we're having a business meeting. One of the brothers stood up and he said, are we going to talk about this? And it was like, well, we know what that person's doing. We know why he's doing it. We should talk about this. This has come up in our ecclesia. This, this brother had no connection to the situation. He was simply a brother in the ecclesia. And he simply didn't like the fact that the ecclesia was trying to avoid an issue. 
And he had an opinion on that issue, and his opinion was different than what the Ecclesia decided to do. And at the end of the business meeting, he said, I, I, that's not what I think should be done, but I accept the will of the Ecclesia as long as the Ecclesia faces the issue. He had no dog in the hunt and didn't even get what he wanted. But he made sure that the Ecclesia didn't try to hide from the responsibility of dealing with the issue. Because we can do that. We can, ooh, this is, this is a tough one. Let's, let's not talk about it. Let's keep it. You know what? Everybody knows, right? Everybody knows we're not going to talk about that, right? No. No, if, it, if, it, if it's come up in our family, then we have to face it just like we would in our own family. When you, when you hide the issues or you act as if they're not there, then they become bigger and worse. And this brother was not going to let that happen. He was zealous for the Lord because he recognized that the Lord was testing his ecclesia to see if they would stand up to this issue. And we did. We had to because he demanded it. Not for himself, but because he was zealous for the Lord. And that's what we should be. That's what Phineas had to learn. Notice Phineas doesn't apologize, nor should he apologize. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But that doesn't make him perfect. The only per perfect person is the Lord Jesus Christ. But it does make him have to face things and face reality, and he did. He said, you saved us from sin today. And they separated in peace. So the obvious final question, I was teaching this class to the CYC one day, and at, I ended it there, and I said, any questions at all? And for a couple of moments, I said, you don't have any questions. And then Joshua raised his hand. I got a question, and I knew he would. And I said, what's your question, Josh? And he said, who's Ed? <laughs> Verse 34, and the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. And that's what Ed is, is a witness. So that's where it becomes this name of the altar of Ed. And I don't know if that was 45 minutes, but that's all I got. Any questions or comments on Ed? I don't know. Yeah, I've got in the margin here, it says, and I know, and anybody have any other versions besides the King James? Because they call it something else in, in the other version. Uh, verse 34, it says, a wit this is a witness. So that's what, apparently what Ed means. I haven't actually looked up the, the Hebrew word for it, but uh, it means witness. That's the, that's the key to what, to what the word means, is, is a witness. And that's exactly what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a witness between the two sides, that they were always to be a part of it. And we know they weren't, right? Later on, they, they do separate. Exactly what, what Reuben and Gad and Manasseh had said would happen did happen. They became, they became separate and they forgot about, uh, the altar of Ed.